simplistic way, you can think of communication as a sender um, on the left um, putting a signal into a communication ch channel that is then picked up by a receiver. Um, and that signal pro provides some sort of information. Uh, obviously, there are many different uh, communication channels. Um, the signal could be a visual, visual signal, for example, the um, uh, posture of the crane, or uh, it could be an acoustic signal, a call associated with that uh, posture that signals uh, provides a bit of certain uh, of, of uh, information to the receiver. Uh, the receiver then decodes that signal and will uh, respond to the signal. And in most cases, that response provides uh, a fitness benefit to both the sender and the receiver. Uh, so it's going to increase the sender and the receiver's ability to obtain food, to obtain resources, to find a mate, to reproduce and to produce offspring, get their genes into the next generations. Um, and so obviously that communication event carries a cost. Um, first of all, you have an energetic cost uh, in terms of the, just the energy required to produce the sound to make the movement. You have a time cost, um, that time spent in the communication event is time not used for looking for food, for example, or mates and so on. Uh, but more importantly, or most importantly perhaps, um, communication carries ecological costs. For example, um, eavesdropping costs. And eavesdropping means that uh, unintended receivers are listening in or looking in or smelling into the communication and extracting information to their own benefits uh, that may um, then uh, uh, cause a detriment, a cost to uh, the original sender. Eavesdroppers can be conspecifics, for example, a rival male uh, using the courtship sound to um, uh, approach the females. Uh, to locate females. A, uh, it could also be a heterospecific, so it could be a member of a different species, a predator, for example, or in many cases, eavesdropping can also occur by prey animals. And that's the si system that we're going to uh, look at today. Uh, so after this brief introduction, I'm going to take you um, to the west coast uh, of North America, um, you see the coast of um, Washington State, you see the coast of British Columbia, and also the coast of Southeast Alaska, the bit that they call the Panhandle. And in that area, we have a very interesting uh, situation where we have uh, two sympatric ecotypes of killer whales. And so there's some debate about the taxonomic status of killer whales, there's some um, desire to maybe split them into several species, but there's no consensus on that yet. But we certainly do have killer whales in that area that behave and look uh, very differently. Um, the northwest coast of uh, North America is uh, home to two, at least two fish-eating populations. Um, in the northern part of that area, we've got the northern resident killer whales. These are exclusive fish eaters. They really like uh, Pacific salmon and range from about the middle of Vancouver Island north to the Alaskan border. And sometimes also, um, especially in the winter months, are found in southeast Alaska. South of there, you have uh, the southern resident community. Uh, these are also fish eaters, ecologically very similar to the northern residents, uh, genetically quite closely related to northern residents and other resident killer whales in the Pacific. Um, and their uh, range extends from about the middle of Vancouver Island through the Salish Sea, Puget Sound, along the outer coast of Washington, Oregon, as far south as Monterey Bay, I think, is, is the southernmost sighting of that population. And so those are two populations of fish-eating killer whales. As far as we don't, uh, as we, far as we know, there's no uh, genetic exchange between the two. Um, but their range also overlaps completely with the third population of killer whales, the West Coast transient community. 
And the slide just shows a short, uh, a, a, um, a small segment of their range. They actually range from Glacier Bay in Southeast Alaska all the way down to Monterey Bay in California. Uh, West Coast transients are exclusive mammal eaters. In 40 years of studies, we've never seen transient killer whales uh, consume fish. Conversely, uh, we've never seen resident killer whales kill and consume marine mammals. So there's a, a very clear econo uh, ecological distinction between these two uh, killer whale types. Uh, so just a, a table here to uh, briefly summarize the main differences between residents, think of residents, fish eaters, transients, mammal eaters. Uh, main difference obviously is diet. Uh, residents are salmon specialists. Um, they have been seen um, consuming all five species of Pacific salmon, but they seem to be really, really um, fond of uh, the big Chinook salmon, the, uh, also known as king or spring salmon. Uh, that seems to be uh, their predominant prey, a big, uh, very oily species of salmon that probably makes very good killer whale food. Uh, transients, on the other hand, are marine mammal specialists. And in the inshore waters where we get most of our research done, uh, their main prey is the harbor seal. Um, there are differences in the social structure. Um, all killer whale populations studied so far seem to have variations of a matrilineal uh, social structure where the strongest bonds are between um, mothers and their offspring. In uh, residents, that bond is so strong that even the adult males and the adult females do not ever leave their mothers. Uh, they travel with their mothers uh, for life. It's only when the mother dies, uh, if she's had more than two daughters, those daughters will then form separate matter lines. With transients, there seems to be uh, more flexibility and at least some males and some uh, females leave the maternal group uh, upon reaching se sexual maturity. Uh, but we also do find very strong and stable associations between uh, adult males and females. Um, it, it could be that, uh, or typically when uh, a female offspring has her first calf, she starts spending more and more time from her own mother. Uh, some males seem to stay with the mothers, others seem to then disperse and go off on their own. Um, there are differences in the movement patterns between the two killer whale ecotypes. Residents, mostly because they follow salmon, tend to be quite predictable and seasonal. So there are certain places like Harrow Strait um, of Southern Vancouver Island or um, Johnson Strait of Northern Vancouver Island where you can go and expect to find resident killer whales because those are areas where the salmon get funneled as they migrate uh, back to the rivers to spawn. Uh, with the transients, there are no very clear seasonal patterns, although uh, they do congregate near certain areas of prey abundance. For example, when the harbor seals uh, wean their pups in about May and June, uh, that's a good um, air, uh, time to find transients up in um, uh, Southeast Alaska, uh, but uh, the patterns are much, much uh, less predictable and therefore it's much more difficult to find transient killer whales. Um, like all delphinids, um, both types of killer whales make three main type of types of vocalizations. Uh, the animals make echolocation clicks. I'll just uh, sh uh, play you a, a brief sequence. These are not primarily communicative in nature, but uh, probably function for orientation, prey detection, and those kind of things. Um, um, both types of killer whales also make whistles. And uh, whistles are usually recorded in close range interactions between uh, animals. So when two groups get together, uh, they may socialize and uh, produce whistles. Um, for long range communication, the most common signal type are pulsed calls. And these pulsed calls are very stereotyped and probably can be used to communicate over distances of um, 20, uh, maybe more uh, kilometers. 
So definitely a long range uh, communication system, uh, but also population specific. So transient killer whales make very different pulse calls from resident killer whales. Uh, different resident populations have different uh, acoustic repertoires, so they don't share calls across the southern and northern residents. Even within a population of residents, you may find different groups that share no vocalizations at all. So a very uh, complex system of uh, vocal repertoires um, and uh, very, very difficult uh, to sort of tell apart. Um, the talk today is going to look at the acoustic interactions between uh, a prey, the harbor seal, and the predator. And it's going to combine uh, data from my PhD, various postdocs, and also research that I've done since, um, in order to address the following questions. First of all, um, we're going to look at the system from the prey's perspective. Uh, and the first experiment I did, or I'll talk about, is can harbor seals actually detect the calls of transients and do they respond to transient calls with anti-predator behavior? And that's really to determine whether there's a cost for vocal behavior uh, to the mammal eating killer whales. Do they, when they vocalize, reduce their chance of making a kill? Uh, secondly, um, the question is, can harbor seals actually discriminate between the calls of transient killer whales, which are very dangerous to them, and the calls of resident killer whales, which pose no threat because they're, they're fish specialists. Um, and then we're going to shift focus and look at um, the system from the predator's perspective. First of all, to look to compare how often the two ecotypes actually use communication in terms of pulse calls. Do transients call less often than the resident killer whales? Uh, secondly, uh, going to uh, prevent some, present some data on a study looking at the behavioral context for vocal behavior in transients. And then finally, we're going to look at whether vocal behavior is predominantly associated with marine mammal calls. And I'll uh, use data from uh, focal follows, but also from some acoustic tagging that we've done uh, on the transient killer whales. Um, harbor seals are the most common prey of transient killer whales uh, in the inshore waters of British Columbia. We don't really know what's happening further offshore. Certainly other prey types uh, feature out there as well. But certainly when we see uh, hunting transients um, in the inshore waters, uh, most of the kills are harbor seals followed by harbor porpoise, sea lions, um, and uh, some of the smaller dolphins. Um, as many of you will know, harbor seals have excellent underwater hearing um, at the frequencies of uh, killer whale communication. And that's very different to the prey of the transient killer, uh, of the resident killer whales, uh, because salmon don't, are not thought to have good hearing at uh, those frequencies. Uh, we know from our own experience, but also from um, experiments looking at communication between wild groups, that killer whale calls can be heard over distances of many kilometers. When we do research out in the field, one of the best ways to find at least resident killer whales is to drop a hydrophone rather than looking with your binoculars because the calls travel over sometimes five, 10 kilometers, whereas you can only consistently detect the animals using binoculars over uh, maybe two kilometers. And so the first question is, do harbor seals respond to the call of transient killer whales in a way that reduces their chance of being captured? Do transients pay a cost for vocal communication? Um, to address this question, I sort of used a very textbook uh, standard um, uh, experimental approach. I had playbacks of control sequences and treatment sequences. Uh, to make a control sequence, what I did is I took a recording of transient killer whales and I digitally spliced bits of the recording that didn't have any calls, echolocation clicks or whistles in it into a one minute sequence. And so you can think of the control sequence of a recording of silent killer whales. The killer whales are present, but they're not making a call. For the treatment sequence, I used the same sequence, but I now digitally spliced um, five calls 
from that uh, same recording into the sequence. Um, what I did for this experiment uh, is uh, we played uh, both sequences in random order at uh, a seal hollowed. And so, for example, we'd go to one hollowed, flip a coin. If it was heads, we'd play the treatment. If it was tails, we played the control. We then went back to that haul out at the same tidal stage, so roughly 24 hours later the following day, and played whatever sequence we hadn't played. Um, we made um, several different sequences to avoid uh, pseudo replication. So we had at least four different uh, treatment control pairs. Uh, we used an underwater loudspeaker to um, play the sounds. Um, Lubell Labs makes uh, very nice loudspeakers um, and they were originally actually designed for synchronous swimming uh, but they actually make very good uh, uh, scientific speakers as well and, and uh, effectively once we were at the haul out we started counting the number of seals in the water around the boat at 20 seconds intervals. We were not interested in seals on the actual haul out just the animals in the water around the haul out. Uh, presumably the animals on the, the haul out itself with their ears outside of the, the water would not hear those calls. Um, the counts were then averaged for the two minutes before and after the playback and the effect size is effectively the uh, percent increase or decrease in the number of seals visible at the surface from before to after the playback. Um, this is uh, what we found in that first experiment. Uh, we managed to do uh, eight playbacks at eight different haulouts. And what you can see is when we played control sequences, there's very little difference in the number of seals. Um, the uh, change is not um, significantly different from zero. But when we played uh, treatment sequences, we witnessed a 50% uh, decrease in the number of seals. So 50% of the seals disappeared immediately after the playback. Um, you may ask what happened to the other 50%. Uh, my uh, suggestion is that the, these are, were animals that were already in areas of uh, safety, for example, shallow water or kelp beds, where they were uh, reasonably safe from a killer attack. I remember one playback where we did the playback, um, all the animals disappeared, but within about 10 minutes, they all resurfaced, but all the seals were now in this very narrow surge channel that was just wide enough that a killer whale couldn't get in there. And so the seals seem to have a really good idea where they're safe. And if they find themselves out in open water where they're vulnerable um, during uh, a killer whale attack, that, those are the seals that responded to our playbacks. Um, that was kind of interesting, but it was also what we expected. You know, uh, this is a cue that signals an imminent danger to a seal, and evolution should have prepared them to respond to that um, um, cue with anti-predator behavior. Um, however, it raised the next question. You know, going through these waters where you find resident killer whales all the time, the question is, can the seals actually discriminate between the cause of good killer whales, residents that feed on fish that don't bother them, and bad killer whales, um, killer whales that feed on sea mammals and uh, pose a real danger to killer whales. Um, and again, you would expect sort of from an evolutionary perspective for the seals to uh, have evolved some sort of discrimination. Because obviously failing to respond to a transient call can be a mistake a seal only makes once. Uh, a friendly whale call from uh, harmless residents, however, also uh, carries costs because it's a waste of time. And you have to uh, remember that in some places, like Jonathan Bay, we do limit the um, playback experiments. And seals may be hearing resident killer whales for hours at a time, constantly for weeks. Uh, and so that if they always did the full escape uh, response, they would be wasting uh, uh, a great amount of time and uh, energy. Uh, the problem with that is, as I've uh, hinted to already, uh, killer whale communication is extremely complex. You have differences between the two populations, but also within each population, and most pronouncedly so in the resident killer whales, got this very complicated system of dialect. So even the same groups in that population 
make different calls. And you know, the differences between members of A clan, uh, one of the northern resident groups in G clan, may be as big as the difference between residents and transients. And so the question is, can harbor seals actually just decode this very complex communication system and still make the right choices? And um, if they're able to do that, you could argue that difference could have arisen in two ways. You could um, argue that uh, you're looking at a scenario of associative learning where seals uh, initially start out completely naive, don't respond to any killer whale calls, but over time they learn to associate the calls of the transients with danger, either because they hear the calls and are then chased by uh, a big black and white menace from the deep, or because they see older, more experienced seals uh, responding to these calls. Uh, alternatively, you could um, argue that the um, differentiation has arisen in a completely different way uh, through selective, selective habituation, where the seals initially, after birth, respond to anything that sounds vaguely like a killer whale, but then over time learn to habituate to the calls of uh, the resident killer whales, the fish eaters, the calls that they hear all the time but that are never followed by an attack, either because you know, they individually experience that or because uh, around the seal hollow, they see older, more experienced seals completely calm um, in the presence of those killer whale calls as well. And so um, one way to test this very elegantly is to present seals with the calls of unfamiliar killer whales, killer whales that they've never heard before. If we're looking at associative learning, they should not respond to these killer whale calls. However, if we're looking at selective habituation, we would expect a very pronounced response to these unfamiliar killer whale calls. And so for the second set of experiments, uh, we used three different types of playback sequences. We used uh, playbacks of uh, calls of the local um, um, transient, the mammal-eating killer whales. Uh, here's one example. And these were effectively the um, treatment sequences from the previous uh, recording. We also made similar sequences using calls of the local fish eating killer whales uh, for playbacks in the Harrow Strait. Originally, we used calls of southern residents for playbacks in Johnson Strait. We used calls of the northern residents. Uh, here is one example of such a playback sequence. This one was made from northern resident calls. And then finally, uh, for playbacks of unfamiliar killer whales, we used recordings of residents of fish eating killer whales from Southeast Alaska, from the South Alaskan uh, population. These are killer whales that are genetically very closely related to the British Columbia residents. They're ecologically very similar. They're also salmon specialists, but because they live at least um, 800 kilometers to the north, the local seals would have never heard these calls. And here's one uh, of those sequences. Again, we made um, at least four different uh, examples of each playback type. Um, and uh, played only one playback at each uh, seal hollow. We used different hollows than in the previous experiment to avoid habituating the seals. Um, for each uh, playback type, so familiar resident, unfamiliar resident, and, and transient, uh, we conducted uh, 10 replica playbacks. And again, we used a random system this time rather than a coin. 
we used uh, three different flavors of Tic Tacs in a box covered with duct tape. And so if I shook one out, it was orange, I'd play um, the transient. If, I, if it was a uh, red cinnamon flavor, it was, um, British, um, it, it was the familiar resident. If it was the white uh, spearmint flavor, it was the um, unfamiliar resident of balls. And again, as I said, only one playback actually to see the highlight. Here are the results, and uh, they are pretty clear. When we played the calls of uh, the local transient, the mammal-eating killer whales, again, about 50% of the seals disappeared um, immediately. Not surprising, as I said, these were the same playback sequences that we used in the previous experience, uh, experiment as the treatment, and you'd expect a similar response from uh, at different seal haulouts. However, when we played the calls of East, uh, British Columbia residents, the seals couldn't have cared less. They really completely ignored those calls. There was no change in the number of seals at the surface for playback or after playback. Um, interestingly, when we played uh, the Alaska residents, um, um, again, the response was as strong as it was to the transients. These were harmless killer whales, but because the seals had never heard those calls, they had no experience with them and they just treated them as a dangerous stimulus. And so that shows very clearly that A, vocal communication is costly for transients because it warns uh, the prey. Certainly the seals are responding to these calls. It's very likely that harbor porpoise, dolls, porpoise, sea lions also have similar anti-predator responses. So effectively, every time transient killer whales vocalize, uh, they forego the chance of making a kill or at least decrease their um, ability to hunt. Um, harbor seals certainly can discriminate between the calls of the dangerous uh, mammal-eating killer whales and the harmless local fish-eating killer whales, uh, but they do so through selective habituation. And so the working theory is that seals are born with a very broad predator image, acoustic predator image for killer whales, but they then eliminate through habituation certain stimuli from that very broad uh, predator image. Um, that obviously is a very effective way of doing things because it doesn't actually uh, require experience with the predator. They only need experience with the harmless killer whales. And so evolutionarily, this system actually makes a lot of sense. Right, so that was um, looking at the system from the prey's perspective. We're now going to switch tack and look at how prey hearing has affected uh, the predator's vocal communication. Again, residents uh, specialize on salmon. And salmon, as we know, uh, are pr uh, prey with very poor underwater hearing. Um, audiograms suggest that they can hear reasonably well to about 100 hertz, uh, but very quickly drops off above that. And so they can probably detect killer whale calls from a few meters away, but not at a distance where it really makes a difference, where they can still have um, a chance of an escape. Very different system for the transients. They hunt seals, sea lions, porpoises, all of which have very good underwater hearing. And so as the previous experiment has shown, transients pay a high price for vocal behavior since the calls alert um, potential prey in the area. So the prey are eavesdropping in on the communication of the predator and make some very informed career choices based on it. And so how has this greater cost of for vocal behavior shaped the vocal communication of transient killer whales? Um, to address this question, we used two different approaches. Um, uh, we used focal follows, um, where we followed groups of killer whales, either with a static hydrophone on the boat or with a uh, hydrophone that we could pull behind uh, the boat. Um, and as we were, uh, as the whales are passing the boat, uh, we measured the distance to the whales with laser rangefinders, um, and um, in the recording, then analyzed the sections where uh, the animals were uh, within at least 500 meters of the boat, so we're not missing um, um, calls that are. Uh, that, that, that are simply too faint because the whales are too far away. Uh, we then use those data to calculate a call rate, 
which is effectively the number of calls um, uh, recorded while we had whales within 500 meters di divided by the number of minutes that the whales were within 500 meters and the number of animals in the group. And so that gives you a measure of calls per individual per minute to account for different group sizes as well. Um, we also um, used uh, data that we recorded using a, a very clever device that was developed by Mark Johnson and Peter Tyag at the Tor Oceanographic Institution, uh, and that is uh, a DTAG. Um, it was specifically designed to study marine mammals, their responses to underwater sound stimuli, like, for example, uh, approaching boats, and uh, we can use them very effectively to get some really cool information on um, uh, uh, underwater communication in these animals. Uh, you deploy a tag uh, using uh, a long carbon fiber pole and the tag attaches to the animals with four suction cups. So it doesn't hurt the animal, it doesn't break the skin at all. Probably mildly inconvenient uh, to carry around, uh, but we don't see very strong responses to the tagging itself. Uh, usually within about 20 minutes after the tackling, the animals are back to baseline behavior. Um, and uh, at the time, the maximum deployment time was 16 hours. So we used these top tags to look at overnight behavior in the transients. Uh, I think now um, um, uh, the group have developed tags that can record for several days. So a really fantastic tool. Uh, while it's on the animal, uh, it records the movements of the tagged whale. So much like your mobile phone uses um, uh, accelerometry to, to tell it which way is up and down, uh, these tags have uh, accelerometry to uh, allow you to reconstruct uh, the whale's path underwater. It uses accelerometry combined with a depth sensor and magnetometer, so it knows the orientation. Uh, uh, in relation to the Earth's magnetic field. So all of a sudden we have um, tools that can actually allow us to visualize what the whales are um, doing. But in addition to that, the DTAGs also record underwater sound at a really good quality. So up to uh, 192 kilohertz sampling rate. So uh, going well into the ultrasound. And so we can use it to determine uh, uh, what the whale hears, but also record any sound that the tag whales and other whales nearby make. So a fantastic tool really to look at underwater communication in cetaceans. Um, <clears throat> the first uh, study was effectively comparing focal follows done on groups of resident killer whales, fish eaters, uh, and transient killer whales. And uh, these box plots show uh, the median uh, vocal rate for residents to be uh, about um, 0.4 calls per animal per minute. So every individual in a group makes a vocalization roughly every one, 1.5 minutes. Um, there's very few encounters where the animals were completely silent and, you know, some uh, they're making one call per minute or a little higher than that. Uh, it is very rare to find resident killer whales completely silent. Even when they're resting, they make the occasional pulse calls, probably just to keep in touch. Very different story for the transient killer whales. Uh, the median vocal rate for transients is zero. So for, for most of the time, the animals were completely silent. Um, sometimes they get very vocal, but this is extremely uh, a rare event. Um, this graph shows um, the vocal behavior of transients broken down by different um, behavior states. And what you can see here is that most of the vocal behavior we recorded occurred either after a kill or in a context where the animals were surface active, where they're tail slapping, breaching, those kind of things. Those are typically um, behaviors associated with social interactions within a group or when two groups meet. The other behavior states, slow travel, travel, milling, are uh, those associated with active search for prey. And during that time, the animals were mostly silent. Very rarely did you hear uh, a, a very a faint pulse calls. Most of the time, the animals were silent. 
And so that shows that uh, the tr uh, transients really only communicate in very specific behavior states, whereas resident vo uh, residents vocal vocalize uh, effectively all the time. Um, the tags also provide uh, a very interesting glimpse into uh, the behavior of the animals. Uh, they record the animal's breathing sounds. And so for example, from the tag record, you can see roughly the minimum group size um, that the animal is in by listening for these non-focal blows uh, that occur when the tag is still submerged. And uh, you know, it gives you a, a rough indicator. For example, one animal we tagged in a group of three, uh, we lost it during the night, but sometime in the early morning, I detected at least five non-focal blows on the record. So it, uh, it was very clear that during the night, the animal had met up with uh, additional individuals. So they can provide information on surface and patterns, but also minimum estimate of group size. Um, uh, tags also record echolocation clicks. Transients don't echolocate very often. Certainly when they're foraging, they don't. Sometimes you hear echolocation after a kill, presumably as they're trying to manipulate the prey ca uh, carcass, but certainly during prey searching, um, uh, echolocation is very rare. Um, and then some of the nicest sounds you get are these uh, beautiful pulse calls. Here's a very um, nice recording from a D tag. And just because the tag is recording right on the focal animal, uh, the signal to noise ratio is really, really nice. And some of these calls may have been made by the tagged animal itself, but others are probably other animals nearby, certainly the last two calls. Um, as I've shown already, um, vocal behavior is associated with kills, so we can actually use vocal behavior to then start listening for other sounds that may indicate that the focal animal has been evolved in an uh, attack on a main mammal. Um, and uh, what I found very quickly was that uh, one of the best sounds to listen out for uh, to indicate predation in these animals are the so-called killing, ramming, and crushing sound. Uh, any study needs a, a funky acronym these days, and obviously that spells cracks. And that's pretty much what these sounds uh, sound like, very much like what you imagined uh, uh, a killer whale ripping a seal's to bit, what sounds like. Um, if you have sensitive ears, uh, please close them now. They're a bit gory, but uh, this is nature, I guess. This is a recording of a group of killer whales handling a prey carcass, um, you know, tearing uh, bits off and so on. Um, and when you hear these sounds, it's very clear that you know, uh, the animals have made a successful kill. Um, the uh, last set of data I'd like to show you um, uh, shows some of the dive tracks of um, uh, the animals that we tagged. And it illustrates um, the results of the previous study quite nicely, uh, but probably more informative from the animal's perspective. What you see here uh, on the left is the depth, and um, on the horizontal axis, you see the time of day uh, from 12 noon one day to 12 noon the following day. Um, the area in gray is um, the area when it's actually technically dark, uh, in Southeast Alaska in June when we did the study. It's only a, a short period of darkness, but this is you know, uh, the time between civil, civilian twilight, which uh, when you are legally obliged to turn your headlights on. So it is actually quite dark. You can't really function without a head torch as a, a human being. Um, these are the dive records um, uh, of three adult uh, transients during that time. Uh, when we analyzed the data, uh, we did find very subtle changes in this dive behavior between day and night. Um, but we did see 
that the animals were feeding, certainly around dawn and dusk, but also at nighttime. The red dots here indicate um, uh, clusters of these uh, cracks, these uh, sounds generated when the animals are um, uh, consuming a prey item. And you can see that some of these, um, for example, in the top track, uh, occurred in pretty much in darkness. So the animals have no problem finding prey at night. And that obviously is interesting uh, because we are still somewhat in the dark, pardon the pun, uh, about how transients actually locate prey. Uh, they're not using echolocation, that's been very clear. Um, and uh, one theory was that they may be relying on vision, for example, diving deep down, looking up, and then looking for seals and sea lions at the surface. They may do that uh, during daytime, but these data show very clearly that it's not the only toolkit in their uh, tool in their toolkit to find prey. They have other ways of detecting prey even in darkness. And one obvious explanation could be passive listening. Uh, the killer whales are swimming along, they're listening for sounds generated by the prey. Breathing sounds, harbor seal, vocalizations, echolocation from porpoises, and so on. Um, the blue dots here show um, uh, pulse calls. And you can see that there's typically clusters of pulse calls associated with the predation events. Uh, but certainly in some of the tracks, you also get other um, bouts of pulse calls, and these would be probably related to social interactions. For example, the middle track is the one that I mentioned earlier, where we tag the animal in a group of uh, three, but then recorded at least five uh, non-focal blows. And so uh, this vocal behavior may be associated with uh, the group that was in teaming up with another group and then uh, doing some sort of social um, behaviors uh, related to that team. Uh, these are three tracks from juveniles um, and again very subtle differences from day to night uh, but also very clear evidence for nighttime predation in all three tags. Uh, the bottom tag uh, uh, record is a bit of a mystery because you could see uh, what could be uh, five or seven, seven different predation events. Alternatively, this could be you know, one prey item, item that the animals snacked on for um, several hours. Um, the tag uh, was deployed as the group of uh, were, were going up a fjord in southeast Alaska, at the head of which harbor seals are popping on the ice floe. This was June when the young pups are being weaned and those pups are now leaving the fjord. And it could well be that the, these uh, killer whales were just grabbing these little seal pups, um, uh, recently weaned seal pups, so we refer to them as cocktail weaners or popcorn. Um, and uh, again, when you look at the um, vocal behavior, you can see that each one of these clusters of red dots is also uh, associated with a cluster of blue dots or vocal behavior associated with um, predation as uh, we already knew is the case for these transients. But between each there's at least one or two silent dives and that's what makes us think that these are probably many individual predation events. Anyway, um, that's really um, all the data I uh, I've got time to show you. Um, a few conclusions. I think uh, you know, the data show very clearly that ecological constraints play a very important part in shaping the vocal behavior of killer whales. Depending on what the animals eat, depending on this eavesdropping cost by the prey, the animals can either afford to vocalize in many uh, contexts like the fish eating residents do, or they need to risk constrain their vocalizations to um, uh, the context when they're not actively trying to feed. Um, interestingly, that vocal behavior shows very striking parallels to killer whales of the Crozet Islands, a study done by Christophe Guinet. And uh, we've also since done research in Shetland where we're also dealing with mammal eating killer whales. And again, very much the same uh, pattern of silent hunting fo uh, followed by um, vocal behavior associated with the actual uh, handling, the eating consumption of the prey. Uh, interestingly, um, Crozy Island killer whales and Shetland killer whales are very distant genetic relative, uh, relatives 
to the North Pacific transients. So we're looking at uh, a convergent evolution rather than um, um, uh, the, the animals being close, closely related. Uh, because of the cost uh, for calling, transients only engage in vocal communication when the benefits are greatest, and that actually provides us with good um, opportunities to find out what the benefits of communication are. Why do these animals actually use uh, vocal behavior in the first place? Um, when we look at um, the two uh, sides, again, in conjunction, uh, the studies of the harbor seals have shown that seals respond to the calls of the transients. Uh, transients pay a high price for vocal communication. Harbor seals are able to discriminate between resident and transient calls quite consistently, and they do so through a system of selective habituation, where they're learning to tune out the calls of the harmless killer whales. Um, conversely, um, resident killer whales vocalize frequently, but transients usually remain silent. Most of the time, the default vocal mode is uh, absolute radio silence. Uh, when transients vocalize, it's uh, only in very narrowly defined behavioral context, milling after a kill as they're trying to consume the carcass, or in contexts where um, social interactions um, provide some sort of benefit. And then finally, um, transient killer whales uh, typically start vocalizing after a successful attack. Right, so that's uh, really um, the end of my talk. I uh, just wanted to highlight a bit of uh, further research. I think you know, it'd be really interesting to look at captive seals, to look at the mechanisms of sound learning and uh, the speed of habituation. Um, uh, it'd be fun to do field playbacks with other species, uh, other pinnipeds, other cetaceans that experience um, predation by killer whales. And some of this research has happened. Um, for example, some very interesting work on pilot whales uh, and um, uh, beaked whales in order to better understand what they actually do when they're disturbed. For example, uh, to learn about effects of maybe sonars and so on. Um, and then the question is, um, because transients don't echolocate when they're hunting, uh, they may be uh, listening for sounds generated by their prey. It'd be really exciting to actually do some playbacks of harbor seal vocalizations um, uh, harbor, uh, uh, harbor porpoise echolocation to hunting transients wearing a D tag and see what they actually do in response to these sounds to test whether um, e um, passive listening is uh, an important prey detection mechanism. If it is, I think that has some very serious conservation concerns because obviously the distance over which they're able to hear these presumably very quiet sounds depends on the background noise level. And if we as researchers or whale watchers or industrial uh, shippers put a lot of noise out into the environment, we could be uh, reducing the um, uh, ability of mammal eating killer whales to detect their prey using passive listening. And I think it's really important to do some further research on that to uh, come up with good noise guide guidelines for the underwater environment. Um, the take home message really is we're looking at a cognitive arms race. You know, the uh, killer whales have a um, need to communicate, but they're also fun to, uh, uh, hunting uh, a very cognitively savvy prey that can learn their vocalizations. And these harbor seals are focusing their real threat um, uh, on uh, focusing their acoustic um, predator image on the real threats in their environment by modifying the predator image through selective habituation. Uh, conversely, the transient killer whales are caught in this trade-off between a need for acoustic communication, but also a high eavesdropping cost in terms of alerting their prey whenever they go um, But The real take-home message really should be seals are much smarter uh, than they look. Um, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Volker.